I was always a storyteller. And uh, I liked listening to other people's stories, and I also liked relating them. And I think I, writing had always been easy for me. Hi, I'm Deirdre Breckenridge. I've spent my entire career helping women to get unstuck, to share their stories, nurture relationships, and to grow their brands. But most of all, to find their voices so they can make a difference. Women Worldwide features the stories of passionate women and the ups and downs of their journeys. With deep insight and advice, let Women Worldwide ignite your passion so you can excel in life. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Women Worldwide. Thank you for showing up every single week and for amplifying the stories of our amazing guests, these accomplished and talented professionals come on the show to give you advice, to share their challenges, and to help you to fuel your passion and to power up your own voice. So today, I'm going to dive right into the topic. The topic is the midwife, women's health issues, and writing. <laughs> what do these all have in common? Well, that's where my special guest comes into the conversation. Joining me on the show is Patricia Harmon. Now, Patricia spent 30 plus years as a midwife, and now she is a New York Times and a USA Today best-selling author. She has books published in more than 10 languages. And Patricia has just released her most recent midwife-centric novel. Um, and it takes the reader back to the beginning of World War II. And she does it in her signature style with a female narrative that gives, historic, that gives a perspective to historical fiction. And I could go on and on about Patricia, uh, but I think it's best that she jumps in and shares her story with you. Welcome to the show. Patricia, can I call you Patsy? <laughs> oh, yes. Everyone calls me Patsy except my publisher and my banker. Oh, so, <laughs> but it's but very people, serious <laughs> people, uh, right? If people were looking for my books, they should look for Patricia. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So, Patsy. Uh, you know, I mentioned that you were a midwife for 30 plus years, focused on, you know, women's health issues. What made you choose that direction as your career path? You know, I didn't really think of it as a career at the beginning. Um, this was back in the late 70s and 80s. In the United States, um, it was very difficult to find a midwife. There were very few of them. Uh, almost all hospitals were attended uh, in the in the hospital. Uh, all, almost all births, I mean, were attended in the hospital. But um, we were part of the counterculture, and we lived on a commune in West Virginia. And there were a lot of people coming into the state from Texas, from New York City, from you know New Jersey, just all different places, buying land because land was cheap and beautiful here. Um, and people from the, the West Coast and, and the East Coast, we're used to the idea of natural childbirth uh, and Lamaze, you know, breathing and that kind of thing, but they didn't have it here in West Virginia. And the usual way of giving birth was, uh, you know, to be strapped down on a delivery table, uh, your baby pulled out with forceps, maybe given a spinal uh, anesthetic. And these hippie homesteaders, and I was one of them, uh, wanted something more natural. And people began to have their babies at home. My really only training was to teach natural childbirth. And I did that because uh, up in Minnesota, I had had a natural birth. Um, so after a while, people you know, were like, well, will you come to my birth? And so I started reading up and studying. And really, um, you know, I was just an untrained, uh, what they call nowadays, uh, uh, a lay midwife, I guess, you know. Um, I didn't have schooling, but after about two or three years, I decided, yeah, I really want to do this and I need to do it right. And I'll go, I went back to graduate school and got my uh, degree in nurse midwifery, uh, which gives you more options. You know, you can do home births if you want to, but most nurse midwives practice in birthing centers or in hospitals. Um, and from then on, I pretty much was in, in a hospital or in a birthing a center, um, not that I had anything to do against home birth, but it gave me 
the ability to serve more people. Um, home birth is really only for the very low risk patient. And there's lots of women that are poor or have uh, bad nutrition or a little bit high blood pressure um, that can still be helped by midwives if we're in the hospital. Now, would you suggest if, if someone um, who was a higher risk wanted to have their baby with a midwife in their home, would you suggest that they go to a birthing center? Is that something that, and would they listen? Uh, yeah, I would try. Um, and, you know, the most important thing is to find out who your midwife's backup is. Like if they don't have a definite relationship with the backup doctor or a group of doctors, it's not a safe alternative. But say you find a birthing center and they have the doctor that they work with and um, you could ask them, you could say, you know, I'm over 35. Does this make me high risk? Now in our practice, I worked with my, my husband who's an OBGYN, um, but was also a hippie with me long, long time <laughs> Uh, uh, but you know, you would go, they would go to the doctor and present you as a patient and they'd say, what do you think? Can we take care of this woman? Um, the one thing about midwives is if the conditions of, of high risk are, are just minor, I think they can really do a good job because one of the things we're trained to do is listen and spend a lot of time with the patient. Docs don't always have that amount of time. So sometimes little cues that things are not going well um, might come up in conversation. Uh, maybe the woman's having too many headaches. You know, that could be a sign of high blood pressure. There's different things we can do. And also the other thing that we're really good at is teaching. So say in, in terms of a patient that maybe was too overweight really to be considered low risk, we might be able to work with her through the pregnancy where she ate really well, exercised, and actually got herself down into the low risk category. So I would start with a midwife or start with a group, uh, even if it was say a university hospital group that had midwives and they collaborate with physicians. Um, that's where you'll get your best outcomes. So the midwife isn't someone really who's just delivering your child. The midwife works with you throughout the entire pregnancy. That's right. Um, and that's a really important part of what we do is the prenatal care and even taking care of pa patients in between pregnancies. Um, I think we can optimize their health. Um, uh, you know, we do more than just medical care. You know, I think it's a lot of social support. Um, my first book was called The Blue Cotton Gown, and I know we'll get into writing in a little while, but it kind of shows what midwives do besides just catch babies. I think there's a lot of old-fashioned yeah. ideas. I think so, too. I'm, I'm glad that you're enlightening us about what, it is, what it's like now and, I mean, and the training that you've had and how you work with the hospitals and the doctors, and it's, you're a part of the prenatal care as well. Do you think that more people are opting for midwives today? Yeah, I think it's a growing profession. And it's interesting to know that worldwide, 80% of babies are born into the hands of midwives. In the United States, it's more like 10%. Huh. But it is growing and the need for midwives are growing. If there's anyone out there that is thinking, oh, maybe that would be a career for me, or maybe they've heard their daughter or granddaughter talk about it. Um, I think the projected need is 30% more midwives in the next 10 years in the United States. So it's definitely a needed profession. And, and you've heard about how many you know, rural areas that don't even have one single OB in the whole county. I mean, that's sure. an area where nurse midwives, if they're willing to go to those remote areas, can definitely be of service. Absolutely. So how did you take your... 30 years of, of being a, a midwife and then how did that end up as your your first book or what what made you transition over to writer um you know people ask me that when i go to bookstores and and libraries and book clubs and they'll say oh did you always want to be a writer and i have to say no it didn't really enter my mind but i was always a storyteller and uh I liked listening to other people's stories and I also like relating them. And I think I, writing had always been easy for me, like in graduate school or even uh, college and high school. I, I could just pick up a, you know, a computer or a pen and uh, pencil or a paper and um, things, words just came easy to me. Um, and so 
what happened, how I happened to write my first book, it was the book called The Blue Cotton Gown. It's a memoir. And um, I was going through menopause. And I think some of your, your uh, listeners will probably be able to relate to this. I wasn't sleeping well. And I, we, I was with my husband and a bunch of nurses, and we had a nice practice, but it was really pretty busy. And I would come out of the exam room just going, wow, I can't believe the story this woman just told me about her life or about her lover or her marriage that had gone wrong or her kids that were getting involved in drugs, just all the more normal things that happened. Right. To people. But they were just um, um, sometimes amazing to me. And um, I, uh, since I couldn't sleep, I started writing the stories down. And um, I wrote them at like a first person, you know, as if I was telling you, oh, my God let me tell you what this woman just told me. So after a while, I realized some of these patients were coming back and maybe it would be for a yeast infection or for some other problem uh, or maybe just birth control problems or who knows what. And I thought, this is starting to sound like a novel. <laughs> so I picked up about, I mean, I chose about uh, 10 patients that uh, represented the cross uh, cross section of our practice, which would be everything from college professors to teenagers pregnant with twins, you know, and then I just kind of told their story. And in between, it tells the story of our OB practice, which I said was with my husband, Dr. Tom. And um, we were having some difficulties because one thing when you go to midwifery school or medical school, they do not teach you is about running a business. Oh, that's right. Challenges. And, and here we were. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, hippies. you're a business owner. <laughs> yeah, ex hippies, right? Right. <laughs> We'd always worked in the university system where they do everything for you, build for you, you know, fill out forms for you. So we were kind of in deep doo doo there for a while. So the story goes back and forth, kind of between what I was hearing from the patients and, and kind of the stress that we were under as a couple and a family. Um, and that's the book that, um, you know, was. Uh, I don't know if it was a, a bestseller yet, but it's kind of what started my career. That's awesome. And now is that book in different languages? I had mentioned that in the introduction. Mm, it might be, but I don't. I, the first one I really remember that they send me copies of a lot in different languages is uh, The Midwife of Hope River, which was my first uh, historical fiction novel. That's and, awesome. why, and, and why did I start writing novels? Because I wrote two memoirs. And then I felt like, you know, I'm sort of milking my own life here. Maybe I should try to write something else. And like I told you, I was a storyteller and it came pretty easy. And that first book that started the series that I'm known for is The Midwife of Hope River. And it was the one published in a lot of languages. And that's the one that brought me into the bestseller kind of Now, range. is that... Um... Is the heroine in that book? Is that you? Do you does she portrayed after you and, and, and your career and everything you've been through? Well, I said it in the 1930s, and I thought, you know, I've lived rurally in the commune life where we didn't have electricity and only had an outhouse and grew our own food and, you know, that kind of stuff. So I thought, I know about that. And I was a former, you know, peacenik radical back in the war in Vietnam. And I made my hero an, a junior, union activist and a suffragette in the 1930s. So in a way, it's me. <laughs> but the funny thing is, I made her, in my mind, to look more like you. Like I had her be, I'm 5'9", I'm I don't know if you're very tall, but um, I'm a big woman. And my, my petite midwife, Patience Murphy, in the first book, wears wire rim glasses and has dark, shortish hair. <laughs> Not, you know, so, but the funny thing is, the things that come out of her mouth would be things that would come out of my mouth. But I, That's tried, funny. To, I tried to make her someone different. It didn't really work, but... <laughs> Oh, that, that sounds great. Did you um, write your entire novel before you had a publisher lined up, or was it just the same publisher who did your memoir? You know, I wrote the whole novel, but my first publisher was Beacon Press in Boston, and on their list they have novels, but when I finished this first historical fiction novel, I was ready to send it to my editor, and I had an agent by then, but it turns out Beacon no longer does fiction. Oh. So I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> uh, 
And this is one thing, you know, for people who are thinking about writing or publishing, I didn't know so much. I really didn't. And, um, you know, I didn't get my MFA in writing. And I'm not even sure if they cover this in, you know, in university programs, you know, the ins and outs of publishing. But I didn't know about things like that, that some publishers don't do certain kinds of things. Uh, even if they really liked your memoirs, they might not take your novels. So uh, it didn't take long, though, since I had two memoirs out um, to for my agent to find a new publisher, which was HarperCollins, and I'm still with them. That's awesome. And did you enjoy the working with a big publisher? Was it? Did you have a team of people? Um, did you ever feel stressed out over the process? Or I know the words flowed. Uh, because you love, you are a storyteller. But how did it feel as you were going through production <laughs> and getting your book ready? Well, they were always very nice to me. So um, I, I never felt like intimidated or like someone was trying to take my book away from me. You know, you hear That's about good. things like oh, that. Oh, sure. You know? No, absolutely. So I felt they were really respectful of me. The things that I, little things that I didn't know, for example, that you don't get to choose the title of your book. Mm -hmm. Once you sell the book, I found that out. Yeah. You did. <laughs> yes. Once you sell the book to them. It's their book. But yeah. they were nice to me, and that I, you know, I, I, um, I had like my first book. I, I was, I thought the name of it should be "The Sound of the Heart," because the midwife is always listening to the oh. baby's heart, and that would be sort That's of beautiful. Quiet. But they wanted the word midwife, midwife. in the title. And so they made, and, and in the book, it's set in a rural area near the Hope River Valley in um, a, a rural county in West Virginia. Um, so they wanted to name the book, The Midwife of Hope River. And at first I thought, oh, that's not very poetic, but now I really like it. I really <laughs> like it. Yeah, I like I the do. idea of, of hope. And it's yeah. so important in these times, I think, when people look with despair at the changing climate or political things around the world, it's easy to lose hope, you know, and to think uh, we're doomed, basically. Right. So uh, that's why I like uh, the title. And all my books now, they say, like the, the one that you mentioned that's just out, um, you know, they'll say... Uh, the midwife, uh, a midwife of Hope River book, a novel or something like that. So people can connect the series. Excellent. Patsy, I have so many more questions for you, but I'm actually going to ask you to hold your thoughts just for a moment. We're going to shift our focus over to the sponsor of today's episode, which is Rutledge Publishing. Speaking of publishers, mm -hmm. um, Rutledge Publishing is one of the leading publishers of academic textbooks and journals, and they also happen to be the publisher of my book, <laughs> which is Answers for Modern Communicators, A Guide to Effective Business Communication. And Patsy, in this book, I have answered over 150 questions um, on reputation, building relationships, taking your brand on social media and content to new levels, measurement and mentoring, and I thought it would be fun if I asked you a question from the book that you can answer, because I've already answered it. So are you ready? I am. And I want to tell you the idea of your book is great. And when oh, I talked about, you. I remember when I talked about, you know, us being new in business, we probably could have used that book. <laughs> so, <laughs> now that Thank I'm retired, you. now that I'm retired, maybe I should still read it. But it sounds, <laughs> and even for writers, don't you think? I mean, people that may be listening to your show, listening to me, thinking, yeah, I've always wanted to publish a book. Read this book first, or, or maybe while you're writing. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so your question from the book is, it's number 81. Why is feedback a gift? Well, I think feedback is a way that you know if someone's listening to you. Uh, whether it be they have read your your piece of writing or uh, whether in personal, you know, that we, uh, you can tell if someone's listening and whether they're understanding. Um, as a writer, I think it's especially important because you can get really into your own stuff and then it turns out it really didn't move someone else or it didn't make sense to somebody else. So that's why I think as a writer, it's important. As a medical professional, a lot of times we don't get enough feedback. 
you know, patients are intimidated sometimes by medical people, hopefully not me or a midwife, but it probably happens where I either said something in words that were so scientific that the patient didn't even get what I was telling right. about, or, um, you know, maybe I was too in a hurry and didn't listen to them. So, you know, it, it's hard to give a medical professional feedback, but it would be a good thing if there is some way to do it. And especially if something bad happens to a patient in the hospital, I always tell them, write to the CEO. They will listen yes. to you. They want, your, they want you to so be their, smart. their customer. Mm -hmm. And maybe it won't change the course of the past. You know, you had an unfortunate experience uh, uh, during your birth or who knows what, but at least they will know that they need to make some changes, you know. So uh, feedback is important in yes. every walk of life, really. True. Feedback is a gift. Thank you, Patsy, for answering the question. And thank you to Rutledge Publishing for sponsoring this episode of Women Worldwide. And listeners, if you want, you can go and download a free chapter of mm. Answers for Modern Communicators. So I'm going to read the link so we get it right. I'll say it first, and then I can spell it out for you. It's bit.ly forward slash learning the essentials. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash L-E-A-R-N-I-N-G-T-H-E-E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A-L-S. Bit.ly forward slash learning the essentials. Thank you. Okay, Patsy, let's dive back into our conversation. So you had mentioned... Um, the business and how <laughs> you were having challenges and immediately, you know, that made me my eyebrows raise um, because in the spirit of women worldwide, we always share challenges um, throughout our careers. So what else about running a business did you have to learn? Did you find uh, maybe difficult and maybe what did you learn about yourself in the process? Well, I had my bachelor's degree in healthcare administration, but the main thing why I got it in that was it was back in the days before they had online um, uh, education, uh, but I needed a four-year degree of some kind. I had a two-year degree in nursing and a four -year, I needed a four-year degree to get into graduate school. So I thought, well, this sounds useful and I could mainly do it at home. And then I had to do, uh, it was St. Joseph's uh, College in Maine. Then I had to go up there for one summer and I had my bachelor's degree. So when we opened our practice straight out of leaving a university, a large university practice uh, at West Virginia University, um, uh, we really, all I had was this degree, but I assigned myself to be the administrator of the practice. Probably not a good idea. And there were a lot, a lot of people said to us, why don't you hire an administrator? And how I was thinking was, that would be a lot of money. I mean, how would we afford it? But looking back, maybe it would have been a good idea, especially someone more experienced. Because like I said, in a university system or a large practice, everything is done for you. You don't really make decisions about billing questions. Um, one of the mistakes that we made, as I remember, had something to do with Medicaid or taxes. Or I, I know what we did. This was bad. I'm going to warn all your, <laughs> your inexperienced Please do share. Yes. Uh, we hired an accountant who was rec recommended to us, but it turned out he wasn't a CPA. He was some other kind of an accountant. And it had to do with taxes that we didn't pay. And then they started withholding all of our make at Medicare and Medicaid payment. Oh, yeah. So we had no money. I mean, we had a lot of private patients too, but that piece of the income for the practice was cut off for a long time until the mistakes were somehow rectified. Yeah, that's but really difficult. That, I think that's part of the blue cotton gown. <laughs> was oh, worried, it made worried. it to the book. <laughs> yes. So I'm pretty sure my husband wasn't taking any income for a while just so we could pay our nurses and our receptionists and secretaries and people like that. Um, so that would be one thing people maybe could learn from my mistakes. Absolutely. And do you find, um, I don't know, are there any challenges now as a, as a writer? I'm sure it's different. Like, for example, do you ever get writer's block? You know, um, I don't very often, and I hear about other writers having that. Um, my tip would be 
and this is something I've learned from experience. Say you set aside a morning to, to write. Now, in your line of, of writing, this wouldn't work, but say you're a, no, a novelist or a memoirist. And um, so I, I would set aside, say, this afternoon to write, but boy, I'm in a bad mood. My son called and asked for money again or whatever, you know, <laughs> I had a snit with my husband, who knows, or maybe it's just raining out and I wanted to work outside and it's, I wanted to go walking or something outside. So, okay, here's what you do. You write what you're feeling, you write it in your character, pick a character and write what Patience Murphy is feeling. She's sitting on her porch. It's a gray day, the rain's falling. She had wanted to work in her garden that morning and then her mind turns to her husband. He hadn't been home for two nights. Where had he gone? <laughs> so you kind of get in, great. You kind of get into it, and then all, all of a sudden you're like writing. Now, when you go back, you might dump that chapter entirely. You know, but it still you opens think, you up. Yeah, you just start writing. And the other thing I found is uh, going back and reading. Like if I'm really just can't write, go back three or four chapters and start uh, editing. And by the time you catch up to where you left off, you'll be back in the groove again. So then you didn't waste your time. You didn't waste your three hours that you were going to write. You actually got something done in the editing and found your place in the story again. That's great. I think it's actually really good advice for anybody who writes. Yeah, yeah even if it's not the chapter that might stay in the book, you can grab your journal and just do that same exercise, just to kind of let it flow, to get it out how you're feeling. And I bet you that would provide some kind of a, a reset. <laughs> just to, yeah, maybe take the block away, kind of, you know, just yeah. by pushing it aside and writing like what you said, what you're feeling. Exactly. So true. What do you think um, surprises you the most about um, your journey? Like, are there any moments that stand out where they were kind of like, aha, or uh-oh, <laughs> if you want to share that? Um, my midwifery uh, career was pretty straightforward, I think, um, except for, like I was talking about, the business angle, you know, that we got tangled up into for a while. Um, so I don't think there were any really aha moments except gradually understanding, you know, how to run a business and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of being a writer, um, I guess the, the biggest surprise to me is the feedback that I get from readers. And I'll get an email every day or every other day of people saying how much they appreciated my books. And one thing, one common thing that comes up a lot is they'll say, you know, I was going through a hard time or I, w I just had had surgery or something and they found my books comforting. Oh, that's and so I, nice I, to hear. And I read about, I write about, you know, the Great Depression, people being poor, <laughs> you know, huge forest fires. Uh, it doesn't sound know, comforting. Coal mining accidents, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that's, I thought, well, comforting. But I think it's partly that the way they're written is as if I'm writing in my journal to a friend that I know, another woman that would laugh at what I laugh at and cry when I cried. And so at times, maybe just having that book there and people read them more than once. That surprised wow. me because um, there aren't very many books that I've read two or three times, you know. So I just figure that's like a really great compliment. But anyway, the comforting angle, I guess, was a surprise to me. It sounds like they feel very close to your character, that that style really just resonates with them. Like you said, it's, it's almost a friend yeah. that you're listening to or talking to. And in, another interesting thing was at the very beginning of the book, it says, uh, you know, that it's fiction and the usual thing, you know, any, uh, you know, relationship to people, place or thing, whatever is purely coincidental. So it says that right in front of the book. But when people start reading the book, it has like a, the date and something, maybe a, a, the name of the chapter, but people start reading it. And some people say they're halfway through the book before they realize it was fiction. Oh, that's <laughs> that amazing. Funny? Yeah. yeah that's they, thought really it, they thought it was really an old timey 1930s journal. 
the other thing that's really fun is the research, you know, because I didn't know more than, I guess, the average person about the Great Depression. But then I have to do all this research to learn about the, the hunger and, you know, the CCC camps that for the young men that didn't have jobs and the politics of the day. And the other books, you know, I have three in that, the Hope River series. So one's 1930, one's 1935, which is the middle of the Great Depression. And then the last one that you mentioned, which is called Once a Midwife, um, is 1941, I think, just before Pearl Harbor. And that was all new to me. I mean, even reading about Germany and how Hitler came to power, sure. things that I sort of vaguely knew. You yeah, know? you have to understand and, the period yeah, to really yeah. get into it and have the character be in that era. Right. That's so interesting. Well, Patsy, I can't even believe that we're at the part of the show where uh -huh. we're nearing the end. You get to give advice to all of our Women Worldwide listeners. So maybe you could just give some advice to how they can rise up and meet their challenges and to play out the career and life that they want to have. I guess what comes to my mind is believe in yourself, you know, believe that you have something, you know, in, in your line of work, that in anybody's line of work, that you have something to share with others that can make the world a better place. And I think if you come at your career from that angle, you have more energy and more courage. If you just say, I want to be a writer because that would be cool. And then they could send me around on book tours and I'd be famous. Uh, somewhere along the line, something's going to break down. But if you say, I have something to share with people, whether it be stories or advice, like, you know, your business book, um, I think that gives you courage and it gives you strength uh, to go forward. Um, so I guess that would be my one liner if I was going to give people advice. That's great advice. Believe in yourself, courage and strength. Awesome. Okay, last question. It's super easy. Where okay. can people find out more about you and your books? Well, it's pretty easy. You can go to my website. You can go on Amazon, any place, you know, online bookstores, or sometimes, and it depends on where you live, but some of my books are in the actual, you know, brick and mortar bookstores. And I have a website which covers all the books. And sometimes when I'm keeping up with it, where I'm going to be, when, uh, that's always hard for me. I probably should hire somebody, right? <laughs> yes. Hiring an administrator, that might be a good investment. <laughs> right, but exactly. It's uh, uh, www, uh, Patricia Harmon, and it's spelled H-A-R-M-A-N.com. Uh, so I'll look forward to seeing you, and I'm on Facebook, and we can exchange thoughts. So it's nice to Terrific. talk to you. Patsy, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing your journey, what it was like to be a midwife, and also just all about your writing experience. I hope that Women Worldwide, all of you listeners, if you want to get a good novel, <laughs> go check out Patsy's books, Patricia Harmon. <laughs> That's how you can find her. So thank you. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you so much. And hi, and keep, keep on there, women. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you Women World Worldwide listeners for tuning into the show and for sharing your feedback with us. We really appreciate it. Keep it coming so you can tweet us. You know we're on Twitter. Go to Facebook, leave a comment. We're on YouTube so you can subscribe to the Deirdre Breckenridge channel and see the show every single week. You can leave comments there. And if you want, go to the womenworldwideshow.com website and sign up for our updates. Okay, friends. Until our next episode, stay focused, energized, and feeling empowered. Thank you.